Hey, everybody out there on the internet. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning into the Angst Podcast. I hope you guys are doing well today. My name is Jericho. I am your host, and I'm really excited to be bringing you guys a conversation on the topic of um, fungi. In the past, I have done a couple of mushroom videos. I have a psilocybin trip report and kind of a firsthand experience of uh, magic mushrooms. I am going to touch on the topic of psychedelics, altered states of consciousness, and how mushrooms can actually manipulate animal behavior. But I want to kind of expand on the topic and go all the way to the fungi kingdom as a whole. And so you can think of, um, when I say fungi, I don't just mean mushrooms. I'm referring to mycelium which is the actual organism of fungi. And so think of mushrooms as like the sexual um, flowering body. It's the reproductive component of the mycelium organism. So um, what mushroom is to, uh, is to mycelium, an apple is to a tree. It's that fruiting body designed to reproduce, produce spores and kind of you know, be eaten or propagate itself into the air so that it can continue to uh, evolve and grow in other ecosystems or environments. And so when I, when I say fungi, I'm referring to a kingdom very similar to the plant or to the animal kingdom. Although fungi is not necessarily as well talked about or as well researched as those other guys. And there's a couple reasons for that. Kind of the obvious one is that we just didn't know what we didn't know. Mycelium itself is this very delicate, it's a single cell wall thick. It's this kind of web mesh fractal-esque. It kind of looks like, like I said, a web or lightning. And it's essentially expanding out and growing and morphing and searching for stimuli within its environment. And so when I say we don't know what we didn't know is... I mean, we don't really know what's going on at the bottom of the ocean, for example. And we can theorize, we have a little bit of information, but we just, we don't go there. We don't spend a lot of time there. We don't really know what's going on. And so if you imagine in the ecosystem like the Amazon jungle or in a dense forest underneath the ground in the earth, there is this whole underworld environment that fungi is just thriving in. And we don't really get, for most of human history, we wouldn't have even had the resources to necessarily tap into or know what was going on down there. And then now that we have the resources or the will, it's still a tricky organism to study because due to its delicate nature and its kind of intermingling shape and, and, and uh, synergy that it has with its environment, it's very difficult to remove and isolate. And that's typically what scientists like to do. You know, they want to have controlled variables. They want to test it in a lab. But if you try to pick up mycelium, it's so delicate that it'll rip or tear. Um, it also isn't going to function the same way in a laboratory or in a controlled state that it would in like a diverse Amazonian rainforest. Fungi is constantly changing and adapting to the needs of its environment, to the stimuli that it is receiving. And so kind of in a cold, stale um, sterilized environment like a lab, you're not going to get the full potential out of the organism. You're not going to actually see how it functions in its natural habitat. And so, for, you know, that's one reason. There's a bunch of other ones as well. But um, that's one of the reasons that mycology hasn't necessarily taken off. And we don't necessarily know as much on the topic of fungi as we would on, say, plants or animals. Um, I do have my uh, notes here as well, guys, just so you know, I have a phone. So if I'm looking down or pausing at all, it's just because I'm checking out some notes. Um, but I just I don't want to get anything wrong here because there's so much cool information that I need to share with you guys. And I think that mushroom, you know, fungi is such a cool topic that I, I just want more and more people talking about it. Um, if for any reason I don't I don't do it for you, uh, maybe I say too many ums or you don't like the sound of my voice. I will recommend Paul Stamets. He's a beauty and a mycologist that is very well known, very well researched and very articulate. Uh, or I will also recommend a gentleman named Merlin Sheldrick. I actually just finished his book. Uh, it's called Entangled Life. A little bit of the inspiration for the podcast because it was just a wealth of knowledge uh, filled with cool fungi facts. He's a brilliant writer. It's a very exciting story. I would highly recommend that book as well. Um, but yeah, um, back to the back to um, the point I was going to say is that uh, one of the, a beautiful quote that I had read in Merlin Sheldrick's um, book was that you can actually think of the fungi kingdom as the gatekeepers of the underworld or the, or the gatekeepers of death which I think is kind of a really intense statement. It's like, whoa, what a, what a crazy job that is. What do you mean, Jericho? And, and so what I think Merlin was saying is essentially um, what these gatekeepers do is that in the event of uh, a death, and whether that's a plant or an animal, if an organism dies, mushrooms or fungi specifically, mycelium specifically, they are going to absorb and extract the nutrients out of that passed away or deceased organism and recycle it back into an, our, our environment. So... If you picture plants, for example, they're kind of the gatekeepers of life. I mean, plants are absorbing solar energy as well as um, CO2, and they're converting through a process of photosynthesis into a usable component or usable energy, essentially sugar, right? And so other organisms can come around and they could eat the plants and they get those nutrients or essentially extract that solar photonic energy from, from the universe. Um, you got 
car carnivores or omnivores that could then eat those animals. And it's kind of just a cycle, right? Like if I eat a cow that's just been eating grass all day, I'm essentially just through a secondary step still absorbing that um, free energy that would have been received in the form of photons from the sun, which is our kind of our source energy for life here on earth. So plants are kind of this gatekeepers of life. They're bringing um, solar energy or, or cosmic energy down and propagating it into usable energy for organisms here on earth. What mycelium are doing is kind of that the back end work of this cycle. And so if a tree is growing in the forest and picture a massive one, like picture the Californian redwoods or something really thick, really old, hundreds of years old, this throughout the entire life uh, cycle of the of the tree it's been absorbing a ridiculous amount of carbon and it's been slowly but surely storing that in its in the organism or in the tree trunk itself so after a few hundred years when this tree reaches uh, reaches maturity f passes away and falls it's going to be a combination of bugs bacteria and mycelium that help decompose and break down that tree absorbing its nutrients and the carbon back into the earth and this is actually what helps propagate humus which is kind of the black earthy nutritiously dense topsoil necessary to propagate new life and to, and to grow plants. And so it's this, you know, they're these gatekeepers of death, but in death comes new life. They're, they're the necessary transition to help propagate and recycle life back into the ecosystem, which I think is just, you know, if you really think about it, that's beautiful. Like what a great job for, for a species or an organism to have, right? But it's not just in the day-to-day -day cycle but in in fact you can actually extrapolate this out out to the macro and um, oddly enough fungi have actually been here on earth longer than plants and animals so if you go 1.5 billion years back you can see fungi in the fossil records in fact plants may actually only exist due to fungi um, the mycelium nature uh, or the way that mycelium works is incredible is the inspiration for the root system of a plant and so you know billions of years ago you would have had algae that was able to exist in the ocean or maybe on the coastlines on the on the side of rock but they couldn't necessarily get inwards into um, land away from water and it was a synergistic relationship between this algae and mycelium that essentially created the first ever root system and allowed algae to propagate inland and actually start to create um, to break down rocks, to break down the nutrients out of rocks, and instead of having a, a hard surface crust, actually start to create a soft humus soil. And then, boom, bam, Bob's your uncle. We got some, we got some life. And so, um, in the in the macro scale, mushrooms or, or sorry, I keep saying mushrooms, but fungi, uh, they can essentially, if we were to picture a mass extinction event, a cosmic catastrophe like the extinction of the dinosaurs, let's say a meteorite impacts Earth creates a massive dust cloud and blacks out the sun. Well, I mean, you and I are done, right? Plants and animals are done. Like we're gonna see a 99, 98% extinction rate here on, on Earth. But there's this organism that exists underground that doesn't actually require solar energy. It can find its own food and it can absorb rock and nutrients out of the ecosystem, essentially anything that it can find, it can break down. And so in the, in the, if all else fails and life on Earth here just gets decimated by some type of black swan celestial event, fungi and mycelium are going to be the organisms that survive and are essentially our hedged bet to continue uh, life on Earth. And it, it would take a long time. I'm not saying thousands or millions of years wouldn't have to pass, but eventually that mycelium would upkeep and upregulate and be able to start to rebalance the ecosystem back to a point where plants and animals can begin to become prosperous again. So in the micro and the macro, I think that's just a beautiful job. The Gatekeepers of the Underworld is a really cool, cool title for uh, fungi. And uh, I just wanted to share you guys or share that point with you guys, because to me, it just really kind of sinks my teeth into this topic of like, wow, what a unique job. Like they must, you know, if there's a God or a creator, like that's kind of an interesting script or, or um organism to write into your system right um, the reason i phrase it like that is actually oddly enough the way that a uh, mushroom propagates so in the event of a flowering mushroom popping up out of the ground there's hopes that it either gets picked up by an animal digested by an animal and then you know pooped out somewhere else and that will allow it to propagate new mycelium or carry on life in a different ecosystem um, but it's also shooting out and releasing spores into the atmosphere and the unique character trait about these mushroom spores is that they can actually exist in a vacuum or in space and so hypothetically speaking if we just uh, stuck a bunch of these spores onto a rock and slingshotted that rock out of the atmosphere and into space and it crash landed on Mars, there's no reason that those spores couldn't survive that trip 
and potentially propagate life somewhere else. And I mean, you know, I'm not saying I know what, what happened here on Earth, but hypothetically, could a, could something have come from the cosmos, impacted Earth that was just full of fungi spores, and then that kind of kickstarted like life here on Earth? You know, I don't know, just spitballing, just throwing some points out, Who, who's to say? Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really cool job that they have. Um, the way that they have really been able to thrive, I kind of already mentioned to you guys, but they have created this synergistic relationship with plants. And so again, plants are really only uh, readily available on, on here on earth due to this relationship. Um, but it's a two way street, uh, mycelium benefit as well. Mycelium cannot produce their own food. They have to find their own food. And so if they can intermingle with plant species and essentially connect to their root systems underground, um, then they can kind of steal and absorb some of that free solar energy or the sugars that the plants get in, in, um, to make this exchange fair, the mycelium essentially act as uh, what's been coined as the World Wide Web. You can think of it as this um, nutrient and information economy. And so it's essentially an exchange of nutrients and resources back and forth. And so mycelium can branch out to distances well beyond just what a um, plant root would be able to achieve. And so this mycelium can connect like miles and miles of forest and organisms all just underground in this massive nutrient and information highway. And so in the event that a plant is receiving not enough nutrients, the mycelium can actually sense that and receive signals from the root systems of the plants. And the mycelium may actually siphon more resources to a plant over on this side of the forest, assuming that on the other side of the forest, there's you know, nutrients are in a surplus. So there's a ridiculous, if, if there's a group of trees that are performing very well and they have a ton of nutrients stocked up, the mycelium might take a little bit more and find a balance of supply and demand with other plants in the forest. So it creates this essentially symbiotic socialist relationship, which helps rise all boats, if you will. So mycelium is essentially helping the plants survive and connect with one another. And it's doing that to its own benefit. It's this big, beautiful um, synergy, which I just think is, again, it's it's borderline unheard of. We would never, if you, got, if you went back 50 years, 100 years, you wouldn't have ever heard people talking about plants in this way. You would have viewed a tree as being a separate organism. That's a tree. If you chop it down, that doesn't affect any part of the forest. It's just a standalone tree. But just beneath our feet and below our vision, there is this massive interconnected world that's essentially like Earth's first economy. Like long before the stock market has ex existed, plants and fungi found a way to exchange and trade resources back and forth in a, in a decentralized state, which is just, again, super beautiful, super impressive, um, and I think deserves to be talked about and deserves more research. And then it kind of begs the question of how can we learn how to kind of balance our own systems or could is there any kind of synergistic relationship the plants seem to be doing so well synergizing with fungi is there any synergistic relationship that fungi and animals could have or that humans and fungi could have um, at least that's where my brain goes and, and this kind of brings me to the topic of psilocybin but before I tell you my, my psilocybin point I just want to add a little asterisk about ants specifically and so um, there is an example of fungi, and I'm going to totally blank or not be able to pronounce the Latin name, um, but it affects carpenter ants. And so uh, maybe I'll put it in the description or, or I'll, I'll put a little pop up or something here on the video if you're on YouTube. But um, it affects carpenter ants. And essentially it is this like cordyceps, maybe it's a cordyceps something, um, but it's essentially this um, fungi that embodies and takes over the ants system itself and so oddly enough if you find an ant that's been infected by this organism what it or by this fungi what it will do is it will essentially climb a leaf f or, a, or a tree or a plant way higher than the ant would normally feel comfortable so it would climb two three four feet up this plant stalk or this tree or whatever it may be which again the ant would normally never do and it would as hard as it can bite in with its pinchers into the root or the vein of this plant tree or leaf and it's going to use that to hold on because uh what's going to happen is that the mushroom itself is going to flower or bud using the ant's body as kind of the host or the um the carrier, if you will, for the mushroom. And so a mushroom is gonna explode out of the back or the head of this carpenter ant. And oddly enough, 
all carpenter ants, if they're infected by this organism, will synergistically perform this explosion at 12 p.m. sharp when the sun is high in the sky. Like, uh, unbelievable. So you've got this fungi or you've got this um, organism that is overtaking the um, direction or the instincts of the ant to climb to a scale that it normally would be afraid of or not comfortable or would never go to on its own terms. And in synchronicity with all other ants in the area connected or infected with this fungi are going to clamp down at 12 p.m. noon and flower and burst into a mushroom. What's really unique is that if you actually, if upon studying this, these ants, what we found is that the mushroom itself, actually there's components that um, can be seen at a microscopic level, taking over the nervous system of the ant. So along the nervous system fibers inside the ant's body, you can actually see these microscopic fungi particles circulating throughout, which is pretty intense and kind of scary. But oddly, um, when you look into the ant's brain, the mushroom is nowhere to be found. It's not crossing into that barrier of, of the actual um, brain of the ant, yet it's taking over its behavior. And so uh, right now, I, th I think the theory is that somehow it is just impacting its nervous system. It's causing um, muscle contractions. And so from the ant's perspective, like what do you think is going on? It knows it's walking up too high. It knows it's going somewhere like it, it would be somewhat self-aware if the mushroom's not in its brain, like its brain would still be functioning like an ant. But yet it can't explain why it's climbing up and why it's biting into this uh, uh, leaf or into this branch. It seems so odd. I couldn't imagine what that experience would be. And the reason I kind of preface my psilocybin opinion with this story is just this is a, a well-studied and obvious example of some type of ex of um what's the term I want here embodiment of a mushroom in an animal embodiment of the of the fungi in an organism and I mean this is this doesn't sound very synergistic it doesn't really sound like it's working for the ant very well but there's literally hundreds of millions of species of fungi and they're all functioning in different ways so similar to you could go to the grocery store right now you could find some portobello mushrooms you could find some oyster mushrooms some shiitake mushrooms some moral mushrooms if you're balling um, and you could cook it up and have a delicious meal use and you know gain some nutrients with that mushroom you could also walk out into the woods and find a mushroom in the ground that if you picked up an eight would just kill you instantaneously um, you can go into a forest and you can find a mushroom that is bioluminescence and is actually producing its own internal light source and glow um, or you could walk into the woods and and you could find a psilocybin strain of mushrooms that when you eat, you know, a handful, just a few ounces, you could have a um, out of body, out of world, out of time, incredible, ineffable experience. And, you know, with less mushrooms than you'd put on a slice of pizza, you can have what I would consider a connection with with God. Um, and so maybe you guys don't come all the way with me on that one. But let me just kind of explain what what my personal experience with psilocybin has been. So, and keep in mind the carpenter ant story when we're talking about this. So there's, there's something going on here when you consume psilocybin. Psilocybin as a molecule fits like a lock and key in the human brain. It is meant to do something. There are other animals that do not have this. When they consume psilocybin, it just passes right through their system unbeknownst to them. But in human beings, we have a system that is designed to recept and actually interact with psilocybin. Um, that's not to say that psilocybin has evolved for human beings. Um, these psilocybin mushrooms do not require any human contact to continue to propagate and come, come along. So evolutionary evolutionarily speaking um, we haven't really been able to peg why psilocybin exists or maybe what the purpose is from the mushrooms perspective but from the from a human being's perspective it's a it's borderline domesticated humans i mean uh people go out of their way to find these mushrooms they're worth ridiculous amounts of money um, people start entire big uh, businesses and drug trades based off of psychedelic mushrooms or psychedelic drugs um it is a massive economy. Uh, it, humans propagate it and grow it and keep the mushroom thriving. So clearly the mushroom is receiving a benefit from the fact that human beings want to find, consume, and continue to grow and propagate the mushroom. So there is some type of synergistic experience being had by the mushroom. I'm not saying that's why mushroom develops psilocybin. There's no proof of that. Um, but it's clearly performing a bit of a function. On the other end, the psilocybin mushroom is clearly doing something for humans. Um, clinical trials when it comes to PTSD and depression are showing great results that um, consuming psilocybin can actually reduce the risk of depression, suicide. It can better um, help 
people that are terminally ill come to kind of a consensus or a um, humble perspective of their mortality or their finite uh, existence here on earth. It can kind of help people transition into the afterlife. Remember the gatekeepers of death comment. When we, when we refer to psilocybin and the fact that when you consume psilocybin, you feel, con you know, your sense of time kind of scales down, um, your connection to source or your connection to others and i don't just mean humans but all things becomes amplified so there's this real feeling of acceptance that everything is is all functioning as one and it's okay and that um yeah and like i, I you know these are my experiences guys i'm not i, I can't necessarily claim for all people, this is going to be the case, but we do have clinical research that is starting to be done. John Hopkins and a great team of people are starting to put out um, tons of clinical research studies that are, are verifying what I'm saying. But this is my personal experience of when I'm high on psilocybin, how I feel. And so um, you get these awe, awe, like these awe-inspiring events. And personally, to me, how it feels is that I'm borderline sharing my consciousness with something else something that is wise and patient and loving and intense and overwhelming and it almost feels like like i'm for lack of a better term guys it feels like i've eaten the mushroom um and now the consciousness of that mushroom's mycelium is sharing me or my consciousness essentially using me as a host similar to that carpenter ant and it's using me as a host to express principles of the universe, of time, of connectedness, of consciousness. And again, this is, you know, this is wishful thinking. This is not proven necessarily, but it's how I feel. And the reason I, I bring it up this way is when you perform or when you do other psychedelics, uh, LSD being an obvious one, um, you don't, the the fogginess or the intensity of that experience is not the same as uh, psilocybin mushrooms. There is a clairvoyant or a very crisp or finite feeling when you're on acid or LSD that still, you know, the experience is very similar in the emotions that you're feeling, but the cloudiness isn't there. When, when you're doing psilocybin or when you're tripping on mushrooms, there's, at least in my experience, a bit of a fog that feels like I'm I'm being pulled or something else is involved here. And that's kind of where like the intensity of like a bad trip or a negative trip can come from is that like you're no longer in complete control of this experience. There's something else that's kind of guiding you. And and if you don't give in and let that that experience kind of just happen, if you try to dig in your heels or push back, you're probably going to have a bad time. You're probably going to start to panic a little bit and freak out. It's probably going to start to spiral. Um, and that's just not good. Nobody wants that. And so um, something I would like to add, and I think I've said this in my uh, psilocybin trip report video, is that let's look at the human system as a series of levers and switches and dials, okay? And so we have our five sense reality, and that's kind of all of these dials are tuned to the right settings to make that happen. If we start to fuck with the dials, your experience is going to get different, right? And so like an easy one's alcohol. If you consume alcohol, uh, depth perception and balance might be get a little bit unstable. Your confidence level is going to change. Um, your memory recollection is going to start to go. You might black out, if you will, not have any memory storage or any um, remembrance of the of the previous events of the evening. Um, and, you know, this is the same kind of with all things, right? Like if you start... Uh, if you zone out and start watching TV, like your your dials are going to start to change in very little bit. If you eat a ton of sugar, you're going to get a little bit of an energy burst followed by a potential crash. So there's a variance of the dials again. Everybody wakes, you know, people across the globe wake up to a cup of coffee, kind of dialing up that attention, that focus, that energy dial a little bit. All we're doing as human beings is just constantly playing with our dial. But we've got we've got our relatively kind of like manual recommendations. This is the sober settings that you kind of want to return to. This is where everything's in equilibrium and functioning kind of optimally. Yet as human beings, we're constantly trying to change the dials. Like we if, if we can take drugs that have no consequences that kind of elevate those systems or enhance those systems, we're gonna do it. If there's associated risks or long-term consequences. You know, maybe not so much, but even then we might still do it. And so when I think about psychedelics or specifically because we're on the topic of psilocybin mushrooms, I think in the past a lot of people have assumed that you're cranking up a dial, that you're, you're taking psilocybin and that's enhancing colors, enhancing emotion, enhance, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but I would invite to you 
the opinion that maybe in fact what you're doing is you're lowering the dials. And so instead of functioning in this five sense reality that you're normally accustomed to, we kind of take down what's called the default mode network. And you can think of this as uh, this network that kind of creates shortcuts or habits or quick answers that allow you to be productive in your life. And so, you know, you don't need to relearn how to tie your shoe every time you bend over to lace up. You know, you just, you have a quick shortcut in your head of how to do this, right? And so you can turn on that shortcut, your brain runs the script and you're nice and efficient, right? And this task can be scoped up to bigger and bigger things. You can become more of an expert and more efficient as tasks as time goes by. Um, but if I asked you to tie your shoes the other way, like instead of, you know, I'm right hand dominant. So instead of leading with your right hand, maybe try leading with your left hand and then see how fast you are, right? Like you're not, you, there's going to be a quick little stumble or hesitancy. The script isn't going to be as smooth because this isn't the day-to-day -day, um, script that you're normally used to running. Another way you could look at it is uh, like me, I've got a bit of a bigger nose. You can see it on the side here. And, uh, but it's not in my vision. Like when I'm walking around throughout my day-to-day -day experience, my brain is discrediting the importance of the value of seeing my nose. So even though if I wanna focus on it and pay attention to it, okay, yeah, it's right there. But on my day-to-day -to, -day, to be productive and to get by, my brain just crosses that information out and says that's not useful, it's just getting in the way, so let's move on. I am of the opinion that this is very similar to the sober state of consciousness, is that you have certain dials that are tuned in a way to kind of ignore the background noise. And so if there's medical, uh, metaphysical phenomenon that's in the universe, which you are not experiencing, which we know to be true, you do not experience all things as a human being. With your five senses, you are missing a lot. I would say you're missing more than you're seeing, or you're not tuned in to more than you are tuned in in regards to the universe. An easy example is something like radio or Wi-Fi. It is all around you, encompassing yourselves every second of every day, and yet you have no knowledge of this. It doesn't influence your system. You can't tune into it without a third party, like technological device or a receiver or a radio. Um, radiation, another example. It's a part of the universe. It exists here on Earth. If you walked into a highly radiated room, though, or if you get an x-ray, there's no feeling or response or actual tangible like nothing makes it real, if you will, from your perspective, but that doesn't make it any less real in the universe. And so I believe when you are on psilocybin mushrooms, you are tuning down some of the dials that normally put all of that background universal stimuli, stimuli and move it to the back so that you can be productive. When you eat uh, mushrooms or when you're tripping on psychedelics, some of that stimuli that normally you're ignoring is now enhanced and you're actually paying attention. We have lowered that default mode network so we're no longer ignoring the background noise. I can phrase this another way in, in the sober reality. I also think that this is what's going on with ghosts or like supernatural phenomenon. I think that the universe is filled with... Um, stimuli all over the place and in our regular five sense reality we only take so much in in the event that there's stimuli in your house or room that is unexplained by your five sense reality maybe it manifests itself in a, a chill or a feeling or a sh or a shadow or again i don't want to get in the topic uh, get too far down the rabbit hole of ghosts but i think that this is essentially what's going on is the universe is infinitely complex you're only seeing a small visible percentage of it and then your brain is going to have to try to fit all of that other stimuli and all that non-visible um, interactions into your worldview or into the five sense reality that you're used to dealing with. This is especially true in modern Western culture um, where we are very left brain oriented. We're very analytical. That is what allows you to be a pro uh, productive member to the economy and to society. It's what allows you to be a responsible adult that pays bills, raises kids, you know, it gets stuff done you but that doesn't mean you should spend all of your life for 90 plus years in that very left brain articulate type a like processing um, form of consciousness i think that there's inherent value with connecting to other states of consciousness and using other organisms or other species to create that for you so if human beings can have some type of synergistic relationship with um, fungi the same way that plants do or with psilocybin then I think that could be of great benefit I think that we can really change the world if we learn how to use that properly I wanted to read you guys a, a quick quote um, there is 
Also a ridiculous amount of uh, psilocybin influence and culture. I don't think the Beatles or many musicians would have been who they were without the use of psychedelic drugs. I think that when it comes to artistic expression, there is value in entering to an artistic or psychedelic or ineffable space and then trying to pull back and produce art to explain that space. So I might not be able to articulate what my LSD triplet look like, or if I eat five grams of mushrooms and start tripping, I might not be able to explain using English very well what I was experiencing, but maybe I can explain it if I was to paint it or if I was to sing it. Maybe I can recreate aspects of that reality by using ineffable or, you know, not necessarily linguistic mediums, but artistic expressions instead. And why do I say that is, um, in my opinion, when I look at Christmas, I don't think that Christmas has anything to do with Santa Claus or even um, a man named Jesus Christ. I think that Chris Christmas is a celestial event. It has to do with the solstice on the 21st. That is when the sun or Jesus falls, dies to the lowest point in the sky where he remains for three days. The sun sits there for the 22nd, 23rd, and then 24th and re-rises on 25th. Um, as a rebirth and a high energetic event of the universe, okay? This isn't necessarily a physical person that was resurrected, um, but I also think that this could uh, potentially be, I mentioned the Santa Claus thing. I think that Santa Claus potentially has a massive influence on our culture via psilocybin mushrooms as well, um, specifically the Amanita muscaria, which if you go onto your phone right now and type in mushroom and click the little emoji, it's going to be that white stemmed, red topped, white dotted mushroom. It's a very culturally relevant white and red, very similar to Santa Claus. Uh, people, when they get into psychedelic states or altered states of consciousness, especially high doses, commonly um, refer to experiencing elves or having little men teach them information or run around, right? Synchronicities are kind of all weird here. Uh, it's not uncommon to see Amanita muscaria propagate or flower out of reindeer droplings, um, cow droplings as well, but reindeer specifically and especially in northern parts of Europe. And I think that this would have had a lot of influence on our culture and our storytelling as time went by, um, bringing little gifts to you, little gifts of knowledge, these elves. Um, if you don't like Santa Claus, if you don't think that he's one, uh, it's hard to ignore Super Mario. Um, Mario is constantly running through the world, solving problems, tripping on mushrooms, and dropping into to other dimensions. Um, when Mario eats a mushroom, the green one will give him life. It's a life source. The red one will make him Super Mario. It'll boost him up, give him a little bit of a buffer, make him more powerful, stronger, more knowledgeable, more capable. Um, those are just a few examples, but I mean, uh, I can also flash a couple images on the screen here if I need be about ancient cultures, mushroom statues, um, hieroglyphics, kind of drawings or representations of things that could be the mushroom. Um, I'm kind of rambling now, but I also like to just quickly add that there's a couple odd things about um, mushroom shapes in general um, and just kind of how they propagate. Uh, again, this is a ramble, so stick with me here. But if you split an atom, it creates a mushroom cloud. So that seems to be kind of like a building block principle of the universe. Um, human penises, if you look at that kind of looks like a mushroom and I mean what do they always say about men like they think you know you got your your brain brain you've maybe got your heart or your soul brain and then what are guys always thinking with they're thinking with their dicks thinking with their penises again just throwing a couple things out I'm not saying there's any real connections here guys but the reason I brought up the ancient cultures and kind of culture and, and pop culture in general is that uh, ancient aboriginals growing up in Central America or the Mayan or Aztec cultures they would refer to mushrooms as flesh of the gods and I think that's because if you were a, uh, a lower hominid or somebody that was growing up in a period that wasn't necessarily immersed in science or knowledge um, or a background, and you found this mushroom in the woods and ate it one day and had this psychedelic time-free god-like connection to your reality, like what would you think? Like if you had never heard of this, if you couldn't watch a YouTube video and get some background information on psilocybin, you probably think that was a godly experience or something out of this world or heavenly. Like it's so intense and, and it feels so true um, that of course you're going to feel this way. And so the Aztecs would call them the flesh of the gods. And if you look in the Old Testament, there's also a quote in the book of uh, Isaiah um, where it states that all flesh is grass. And what it means by that is that as I already went over this, but as a cow, for example, the only reason that a cow exists is because it can eat a ridiculous amount of plant life. It can propagate its own energy from that solar energy using the medium of plants as an exchange of resources and, and nutrients. 
And so the only reason that that flesh of the cow can even exist is because of grass. But then I'm going to take this one further and say that we've talked about how plants evolved and the synergistic nature of the wood wide web and the nutrient sharing of mycelium. So if we go underground, kind of when you think about it, all grass is fungi right? Like without the fungi, there wouldn't be this, this humus soil or this exchange of nutrients for grass to propagate and to thrive. And so could I, would it be fair enough for me to say that all flesh is fungus if we're, if we're making those steps? And again, these are ancient cultures, ancient wisdom. This isn't my words. These are, these are words from the Bible, words from the Aztecs. Um, it's kind of an interesting thought, right? Like again, without mushrooms here on earth, without the fungi kingdom, would life have ever even propagated or existed in the first place? And so I think we need to give credit where credit is due. Uh, the gatekeepers of the underworld have been here for a very long time. They are constantly providing us with nutrients, uh, new pieces of information, um, weird synchronicities and synergies with other organisms. And then when we get into the psychedelic states and the altered states of consciousness, it's just, it's a whole, oh, it's a rabbit hole of knowledge that I think is worth exploring and worth talking about. Um, I think that's it guys. I think that's mostly what I wanted to say. Uh, hopefully that kind of had some congruence and a little bit of flow and made sense. Uh, if there's anything I missed, some cool fungi facts that you want to share with me, please comment down below. Um, or if there's any other topics that you guys ever want me to touch on, I'd also, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. So uh, if you made it this far, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, much love. We'll see you again.